Home builders got crushed. Intermarket correlations continue to diverge. Signal charts are showing mixed signals. And we hit another all-time high. What the heck is going on? That's what we're going to talk about on today's Stock Market Brief, where we navigate the financial market through the lens of technical and financial market analysis. If you haven't done so already, make sure to hit that thumbs up. It is greatly appreciated. It's a pretty cool retro thumb. Let's get into it. All right, people, friendly reminder to look at the description or the pinned comment to download this chart tech for absolutely free. And then you'll find more information about our swing trading community where we offer all types of benefit for nine bucks a month. We're going to go ahead and start with letting you know that there are timestamps in the description below if you'd like to hop around. But there are some important things that we will be discussing. So stick around. We're going to start with what's on deck. We're not going to spend much time here. But it's still important to note that we do have a big earnings day tomorrow. After the close, we got Tesla before the open AT&T. We had Netflix report after the, the bell, and it is up so far. So we'll see what happens after that. DR Horton reported, and we will talk about what that is showing us from a historic standpoint, getting hit to the downside. It's always important to look at the earnings expected moves. If you don't know how to do that, I do have a video on that. I think it's in the description, but I do go over how to pull up daily moves, weekly moves, and then obviously you can use the same methodology for picking up these. Now, Netflix did tag its earnings expected move to a T. So we'll see here how that plays out when you know let the market open. Okay, going into tomorrow, as far as macro data, not too much, but we do have some stuff 15 minutes after the opening bell, and then an hour after opening the bell. That's a, you know more of an important type. That's why it's in bold, right? They're rated two stars. So we got comp global composite PMI flash, global manufacturing PMI, and some global services PMI flash too. So something to be just aware of if you are trading intraday. We're going to take a look at the market view and kind of point out here one of the things that we just mentioned about intermarket correlations that are continuing to diverge. We'll talk more in the intermarket correlations or intermarket timestamp in the description just a little bit later in the show. But what you'll see here is something that I find interesting. I'm going to look at the year-to-date column. The year-to-date column, and this is just that overall, a lot of different important sectors that I that I watch, right? And one of the ones right here up at the top, that's the most, the highest performing year-to-date is actually the 10-year yield. And up there too on the list is the dollar. We have the UUP ETF and then the Dixie right there, 2.5%. And this I find a little bit interesting because when you get these, one, you typically have something like oil perform well too because there is typically a pretty strong correlation. So that correlation's on because USO is right here, 4.52% up year to date. Now, what I find interesting is that technology is up here, right? So this is being driven by that one name, NVIDIA. NVIDIA has been a monster ripper, and this could be why that we're starting to see technology really start to hold together. But that's not the only one. Apple's starting to really catch some steam, too, to the upside. But nonetheless, it is interesting to see tech up there when we have the 10-year yield rising as it is alongside the dollar, okay? And if you look down the list, IWM is actually the one that is struggling out of the SPY, out of the Qs, and that one is down currently year to date. We'll get a little bit more into detail a little bit later so you can visualize what it is that I'm saying. If we take a look at the 11 sectors that make up the S&P 500, consumer staples led the way. So it was actually a risk on off type of day, seeing the consumer staples lead the way. The Dow Jones was flat. S&P 500 was rather flat to slightly up. The NASDAQ was up a half a percent. And then small caps took the brunt of the force today down 0.5%. But they did start up on the day. So they closed you know, a little bit off the lows, but they started at the high and then they kind of reversed course. And that's interesting to say the least because they do have a pretty strong negative correlation. So that correlation is holding IWM and the 10-year yield. And the 10-year yield was up today, 1.17%. We're going to hop into the indices, go over some monthly charts and where we stand from an expected move standpoint. We'll go into some daily charts and we'll get a little bit more tactical. Then we'll hop into some other things. Spy on the daily time frame. This is one of the channels that I'm watching. Not going to spend much time there, but we talked about how it'd come down here, right? There's been multiple, multiple taps. And where can we potentially go? Well, we might find resistance up at that upper portion of the channel where we saw that resistance before. As it stands right now, we're above the previous all-time high. And we haven't actually back tested it yet. So that can be something to potentially watch for in the near future. If we come up a little bit further, if we come back down, make sure that you're paying attention to a possible undercut and then puts in what's known as a higher low. So as it stands right now, the, the trend is clearly still up and bullish, but we are getting a little frothy in this recent 
move, okay? But this doesn't mean that it can't go higher, right? If we look at the 15-minute time frame, you can, like I said, download the chart deck to get these levels on your chart. That's tomorrow's daily expected move. Then I have in orange the weekly expected move, and pink is the two standard deviation move. And even if we were to take a big hit coming into two standard deviations come tomorrow, that would be right at around the five-day moving average. And the five-day moving average is currently inclining. So not only, you know, is that a bullish sign, Price is above it, it's trending up, that's bullish, but we're also in a positive gamma territory. And we'll talk about the gamma levels here in a uh, few moments. Okay, so overall, we saw a little bit of a squeeze push higher today kind of running into this area of resistance. If we can get above that, that opens the door to at least tag the upper daily expected move, potentially even the upper weekly expected move there too as well. You can look at this as just a consolidation or a you know bull flag taking place as it stands right now. Now, if we start breaking down, obviously, Pay attention to where the five-day moving average is coming down into. But if we break down further, just pay attention to where all this other price action was, where it was prior resistance. Prior resistance can become potential support. So that's what I'd be looking for as far as downside goes. But right now, everything looks pretty good. Now, if we look at the monthly time frame, the upper weekly expected or upper monthly expected move is at 49.10. So these were levels of risk that the market priced in a month in advance. So we pulled these at the end of the prior month, and it gives us an idea of what the market it's anticipating as far as forward-looking risk. And that upper level right there is at 49.10, and we had a high of 48.68, so we're not too far off of it as it stands. So that could be a potential level that if we hit here, you know, in the next day or so, you know, okay, that could be up around the rest of the move for the month until we have that updated. Okay, if we take a look at the Qs, the Qs are also in this channel, but it's a little bit more parabolic of a move, meaning that it's at a steeper incline than the S&P 500. But you can see we've had multiple tags at the bottom, multiple tags there at the, at the top, and we've been on a pretty strong move here on some strong volume to back it. So even if we were to consolidate and volume were to dry up, that would be a good sign, see if it can hold that trend and hold the year-to-date anchored view off for a potential push even higher, right? Putting in a series of higher highs and higher lows. Now, if we start breaking down from the year-to-date anchor VWAP, if we start holding down below this trend, that could be where we go into a period of longer consolidation or a period of a pullback. So that'd be something to watch. Now, if we continue to push up higher, just watch the upper area of this trend where it may be or how long it may take. We'll go into some signal charts here momentarily. If you look at the monthly time frame. Take a look here where the, the lower monthly expected move was 392.27. Take a look where price came to. It came right down to it, but it was also in confluence with the rising monthly 5 EMA. So the lower was 392. We hit 395.34. So within just a few dollars, okay? And then, and it's a pretty large product. So to come within a few dollars and bounce from that level, it's pretty, pretty spot on. If we take a look at the upper monthly expected move, 426.77, and we had a high so far of 424.73, a close at 423.48. So if we want to push a little bit higher, this could be a level where obviously where it feels more comfortable and safe. It's if we start pushing outside of these levels where we might see some more dynamic hedging take place. But you can see as it stands right now, the month is moving exactly how the markets, the options market anticipated it to move within this risk range. If we take a look at IWM, IWM, as we stated, started off the day really strong, but then it closed near and around the lows. We bounced from the swing high anchored view up, so we'd wanna hold that level, okay? The year-to-date anchor view up is starting to turn around to flatten out, so that's a positive sign. You'd want to hold that level there too as well. Now, if you're holding this for a longer period of time, you may look at this and say, yeah, I think it's just a flag pattern and it broke out, and even if we pull back, that's totally fine as long as we can hold and potentially turn around and go try to swing for that upper prior high. It's when you start breaking down below these levels and even the year-to-date anchored VWAP, you want to be a little bit more cautious. So for example, if we come down, that doesn't mean it's going to come down here and break this low, but what you'll want to see is price to re, re kind of, um, regain control, I should say, of the year-to-date anchor view to potentially make a U-turn play and you, you you don't waste your time, you know, holding for a potential longer drop, but then you wait to see if you can re-enter for a move, move higher. So that's just a way of potentially being tactical. But like I said, everyone has their own way of approaching the markets in different time frames, right? So there's a strong move, we might pull back a little bit and so forth, right? Say if people are looking to hold this for 30 years, 10 years, 20 years, and then, you know, the daily time frame right here might not be nearly as important. You might be looking at a lot larger of a time frame. And if you're not looking to hold it for, you know, multiple months or multiple years, you might be looking at the smaller time frames. But that brings me to the weekly time frame. 
I wanted to show something pretty interesting here. First and foremost, let's highlight the area of resistance here on the small caps. And you can see this prior resistance in 2019 to 2020 before the pandemic hit. We came all the way back up to that level and we gapped through it. That's a breakaway gap to the upside and we saw that screaming price momentum. Then we went in sideways, okay? And I remember talking about this up here, you know, uh, watch for a breakout that's very bullish, but always be cautious of a bull trap. And right here we broke out and that's where the bear market really kicked into high gear. We broke out and we pulled right back into this kind of volume shelf right here and we started breaking down further and then it acted as a level of resistance. The reason why I'm showing you this now is because we've tagged this level multiple times and this 160 level seems to be incredibly important. So we want that to obviously hold. Really it's down to around that 150 area here too where that volume is, okay? So this zone in here you really want to have hold. But we started breaking out again, and it's very similar to what happened here. That doesn't mean it's going to play out the same way, but just be mindful that we did break out and we came back within it. So we want to recoup this 195, this 200 level, like we previously stated here. And if we start moving higher, I'd be paying attention to where all this volume traded up, where price can get a little bit choppier again eventually. And that could be right around that 210, 215 area if we can recoup and um, you know close above that 205. So right now, I mean, it's it's good to see this higher in the short term, higher high, right? And then this would technically be a higher low. This higher low, we would want to hold, right? Because if we don't break this high right here and we come down and we break this low, well, then we have a lower high and then a lower low. So we just have to be more patient if that were to take place. And if I take a look at the monthly time frame here and look at where the monthly expected move was, take a look, 189.72, we came down and we tagged into the rising five period EMA. And I want to show you something. What's the difference really between this bull trap and the possibility of this bull trap? It has to deal do with momentum. So if we look at the price percent oscillator, you can see when we did break above here, this was coming at a time where the price momentum, uh, price percent oscillator was starting to curl down. Okay, but now we're starting to see that little breakout, but we're actually starting to see this pick up steam and get back above zero, which could be a potential positive sign. Yes, if I dig into the yield curves and when they invert and when we go into a rate cutting cycle and look through history, you know, I've seen it be pretty bearish, especially for, you know, small caps for retail names. But I'm just calling out what it is that I currently see here on this chart because from a risk to reward perspective, yeah, if we get back below the, the 5 EMA, that could be bad. If this starts turning back around, okay, cool. Yeah, that could be bad. But as it stands right now, look at it. We tagged the lower monthly expected move. We came up from it. So the market's doing exactly what the market anticipated. And as it stands right now, coming into the end of the month, this is just an inside trading candle with inside a high volume, you know, breakout type bar. And if that holds, right? This is all this is right here is a consolidation. So we wanna hold that month low, and then we wanna start seeing it break above 200. Personally, I'd like to see it start breaking above there next month and have a closing candle that looks similar to this, or maybe, you know, maybe even green, who knows, like right around in this area, if that turned green, or you have this little doji candle, then we might be able to play for an inside trading candle to the upside and even that quarterly expected move, which is right around that 219 to 20 area where that high volume node is that we just previously discussed. Putting things together, baby. Multiple time frame analysis. Let's take a look at book map and look at some secret levels of high liquidity. Going into tomorrow, looking at ES, there is this level up here at 49.20 with 590 contracts. Below that, we have a 48.50 level with 555 contracts. The longer that these levels stay here, the more likely it is to have that liquidity filled. We're not too far off of 49.20, so I think that that's a possibility going into tomorrow. Doesn't mean it has to happen, especially if news were to occur and the market flips over. But if this liquidity stays here, I think that that's a pretty good chance that we start pushing up a little bit higher. This white line is actually ES daily expected move, which is, you know, 499 to two right around there. So it's right in confluence with this level. So if we just tag the upper daily expected move coming into tomorrow, we would be filling that liquidity saying, seeing as if it's not pulled, you know, before the market open or whatever. And then we our lower expected move is about 487.9. Okay. 
So let's go ahead and look at some gamma levels now to really to, to hone in on where price may pull to or where price might push away from. So going into tomorrow, local support looks like it's about 48.60. This is using S&P 500, OANDA, O-A-N-D-A, on TradingView. And then we have a pretty strong level here. This is the call wall at 4,900. And these can act as potential levels of resistance. Remember, all last week, we were talking about the call wall at, what was it? 4,800, right? Was it 4,800, 4,850? I can't remember. It was, I believe it was 4,800. And what had happened was, you know, very simple. We said, once that gamma rolls off, once the expiration happens, we may get that, you know, unpin for the market to move more freely. And well, we started ripping up higher, getting passed through that 40, uh, 4,800 level. So now we're at 4,900. If we end up there, we can potentially get pinned again until that gamma rolls off. But as it stands out, 4,860 to the low end as far as potential gamma support. Below that is 4,850. Uh, and then, like I said, potential area to watch for is that 4,900, which is pretty close in confluence with the monthly upper expected move. Okay, let's hop into some intermarket things that we talked about a little bit earlier, but get a little bit more into detail. I showed this chart yesterday, won't spend too much time on it. 10-year yield and the dollar are important intermarket assets to obviously pay attention to. And what we've noticed was there's a strong correlation that when these move up together, or not even together, but you'll see the S&P 500, that's when it sold off. And then when these went down together, the S&P 500 went up. But more recently in 2024, this is where it's getting a little head scratcher. And this is why I haven't, I, I don't think that the market's really decided where it's going to go quite yet. The 10 year yield has been rising, right? It's the one of the highest performing assets of the market view that I, I am watching is up se over 7% year to date. The dollar is performing incredibly well for the start of the a year as well. But the S&P 500 is doing the same thing, all right? So the S&P 500 is moving up very nicely. Even the Qs are moving up nicely. And that could be driven by that one big market participant, NVIDIA, how it's just been parabolic in nature of moving. And we do have that earnings season coming into. So something is something is interesting. Something is lying here. Um, and then if we take it a step further from an intermarket perspective, if we look at the yield curve, right? When the yield curve inverted, that was actually, we started noticing this interesting correlation that when we go deeper into inversion, the market didn't mind it, right? The market went higher. We go deeper into inversion, the market liked it. Deeper into inversion, market liked it. Deeper into inversion, market liked it, okay? Deeper into inversion, market liked it. However, when we start uninverting, we've noticed that the market doesn't like it, okay? So not only during that same period where the 10-year yield you know, was, I think, yeah, 10 year yield was rising during that period. The dollar was rising pretty rapidly at that period. That's when the S&P 500 right here was falling. It was that period right there. So the yield curve was uninverting. And what I find interesting here is, yeah, we started getting deeper into inversion to about this point, but the market continued pressing higher despite the yield curve starting to move and steepen up to try to get uninverted, which we're at about, they were inverted 17 basis points right now. So it, it's just, it, it's a, I, I, I couldn't, I can't tell you how this is going to resolve, but I can say from, from the prior history and the short history and looking at correlations, something doesn't add up. And when something doesn't add up for a period of time and these correlations still stick, something can happen. And we'd look back at history and we'd be like, oh, okay, well, this is what's probably taking place. Now, if I add on another layer of that, we look at something like high yield. High yield has a very strong correlation to the S&P 500 and to the Qs, Right. High yield goes up. That's risk on, baby. High yield, right? And then if you look at the SPY, it's actually going higher, but high yield is diverging. Now, I've shown this chart. It's, I call it, you know, smart money, bonds, right? And versus the dumb money, the equity market. And, you know, we've showed throughout history that, hey, if this puts in a lower high for a period of time while the S&P 500 goes higher, dumb money is telling us something here is not right. And then smart, you know, the, or sorry, smart money is telling us something's not right with dumb money. Um, and vice versa, if 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 a smart money, a bonds is putting in a higher low, but yet the S and P five hundred is putting in a lower low, so people are getting all panicked here. But the bond market is saying, no, 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 I think we're I think we're good. We've seen that divergence play out to the upside too many times. So I'm just calling it out here. You can see it's not necessarily bearish for HYG, but you can see price action putting in a low, higher low, higher low, higher low. And, but it's putting in a high and a lower high 
as it stands right now. So price is compressing. So if we start as, and remember markets move between expansion and contraction. If we can, if we expand to the downside, I think that that's what's going to knock the S and P 500 back. And we could go into a little period of consolidation, pullback, et cetera. Now, if we start breaking out and get back above this prior swing high, that could actually add more juice to the fire here to continue to see some more upside momentum. Now, we talked about the home builders getting crushed. This right here is DR Horton. They reported earnings. We have some more home builders reporting earnings here soon. It was down 9.25% on the day, a pretty strong move to the downside. And these have been relatively strong. And this is important too, because, you know, I mean, I don't have the long term chart, but, you know, going into the financial crisis, home builders gave us a signal five months in advance. They were not putting in new highs while the SP 500 continued to put in new highs. And in 2022, we talked about these divergences from a shorter time period where we saw matching highs versus a higher high or lower highs versus a higher high here in the SP 500. And it resolved multiple times to the downside. And on the flip side to that, when we saw home builders in October put in a higher low, SPY, right, S&P 500 was putting in a lower low, okay? So basically it was telling us some potential insight here, that divergence that we might start to find a bottom in the market, okay? It's not, doesn't mean it has to be, you know, accurate all the time, but the reason why I'm pulling it up here is because we have just about matching highs. So if home builders are taking a hit right now and we're going to start pulling down, I mean, this is still a pretty strong uptrend, but look at the S&P 500. It's been that parabolic strong move and then home builders are kind of getting caught up right here. So if this resolves to the downside, that could potentially be our early signal that things may be, you know, uh, time to cool off. But this is all, like I said, this is all happening with the S&P 500 making all-time highs and which is not a, necessarily a bearish thing. But in the last video, we discussed the other previous times that we went to all-time highs with very similar type scenarios. If you take a look at value line geometric index, this is basically looking at equal weight. We still are diverging here too as well. Many times throughout history where we put in a lower high and equal weight, but the S&P 500 put in higher, we saw it resolve to the downside. So if equal weight starts taking out this prior high over here, that'd be a positive sign and it would, uh, it would, neg uh, it would negate this divergence that's currently building. And then if you follow something like Dow theory, we're looking at the Dow Jones composite average up here. And the Dow Jones composite average is consisted of basically three industries or three sectors. That's the industrials, the transports, and the utilities. And when you watch this and you see these divergences build over the course of four months, or sorry, four weeks to eight weeks, it could really mean something is happening under the surface. And it doesn't necessarily have to always resolve in a poor way or a good way, depending on what the divergence is telling us. But take a look here how the industrial average has been, I have this in black, we've been putting in, you know, the higher movement to the upside. This has been kind of trending higher, but this has been diverging from transports, okay? And then if you put on utilities to that, that's also been diverging from industrials. And then you look at the Dow Jones composite, yeah, it is putting in a higher high, but in recent trade for the last two, three months or so, you can see it's rather matching highs right in this area when the industrial average is the only one moving higher as it stands. Okay, so if this divergence continues to build, that's not a good sign for the industrials. We need this stuff to either catch up or this to resolve to the downside and, and rework itself to get rid of these divergences. Let's take a look at some of the signal charts really quick and see what they're telling us. First, we're gonna look at the summation index and then we're gonna look at the other summation index. This one's for the NASDAQ composite. And remember, we identified a potential change in trend here. It went down, it went up, and now we're starting to squeeze a little bit higher and this is starting to turn. But remember, this is still diverging. So price action's moving higher. This is heading lower, right? And we've still identified a potential change in trend. Okay, and then on top of that, you look at the Nasdaq McClellan oscillator over here, and we haven't even ticked above zero yet. Now, we did reach a very extended area because we can get oversold quick, okay? And if you look straight up to the top of the chart, we started bouncing kind of from exactly that level, wherever, I don't know if it was a little bit after this or it was right around this area, but we started bouncing pretty strong, okay? So we'll continue to watch and see what develops there. If you look at the NYSE summation index, same situation. We have identified a potential change in trend, and this one is obviously not nearly as strong as the NASDAQ composite because it's been, what, consolidating, okay? So it hasn't identified a new trend to the downside, but it did tell us that, hey, you know, this is where we could potentially consolidate. Now, Price action's been heading higher and we have about matching highs here, but look at the NYSE McClellan oscillator. You see that this has been diverging and then heading lower. So we're still below that zero marker here too as well, which is a little concerning. So with that said, 
We are at all time highs, okay? That is not necessarily bearish, although there are bearish things taking, you know, to take into consideration. So how do we approach this from a tactical standpoint? I, I bring it back always to this. We have a rising five-day moving average and prices above it. If this starts flattening out and going negative and price gets below it, that's when you want to be more cautious from a shorter time frame because the shorter time frames could tell us the, the when a potential bigger train, ch change in trend may happen. And then the last piece there was the gamma flip line. We're in positive gamma territory as it stands right now at 4810. That's where dealers look to buy the dip and sell the rip where volatility kind of subsides and you kind of slowly move and grind up a little bit higher. Okay, that's all I got for you on today's episode, everybody. Hope it helped out. See you later.